All right, I wanna welcome everyone to this seminar on leaky gut syndrome in horses. My name is Dr. Jimmy Nichols and I will be doing the presentation today. I am the Director of Nutrition for Stride Animal Health and for Blue Bonnet Feeds. And um, leaky gut is a topic that's becoming more uh, prevalent in conversations in the equine industry. And I think that there still is a lot of mystery around it and a lot that people don't understand. So the purpose of today's uh, webinar is, is really to bring light, uh, kind of a bring a, do just an overview, a, a broad overview of what leaky gut is, you know, the signs that um, you as horse owners can use to recognize it, and then also provide some information on tools that are available to you to help prevent it and to support horses who may be suffering from it. So leaky gut really is kind of the, the latest buzzword in both human and in equine health. And it's, it's kind of interesting because when you say that word, you know, leaky gut to someone and they've never heard it before, I mean, I can only imagine all of the things that are going through their head. I know the first time that I ever heard the term, I had a really hard time figuring out uh, what they were talking about. And the images that came into my mind were um, a lot like this cartoon picture where the guy is saying, uh, dude, and he's pointing at his friend who's drinking a soda and he has holes in his abdomen with the soda then leaking out. Um, obviously, that is not what leaky gut is. Uh, what it really is, is the, the gastrointestinal tract has become injured in some way. So either the cells themselves have become damaged or there's a breakdown of tight junctions. So we're going to get into to what that looks like. So the actual definition is, of leaky gut is separation of epithelial tight junctions. Those separations basically are allowing pathogenic bacteria and undigested proteins to pass into the bloodstream. Now, let's simplify this a little bit. I want everybody to think about those candy necklaces, the little round candies that are strung on the elastic bands, and, and when you stretch them out, the candies separate. Okay, so imagine that this candy necklace is sitting there. Uh, imagine that as a cross section of the intestinal tract. You're looking right down the intestine. Now, when the, when the candy necklace is sitting there without being stretched, those cells are all held together. There are no gaps. They're all tightly packed in. Okay, That's what we would want in a healthy intestinal tract. The cells that line the intestine are held tightly together by what are called tight junctions. Now, let's imagine that um, a three-year-old child has gone in and eaten a few pieces of this candy. Or maybe you have just taken the candy necklace and you have stretched the elastic. Those candies then separate and there are large gaps between those candies. Okay, that is reflective of what's happening when those tight junctions in the intestinal tract fail. There are gaps that then allow things into the body that shouldn't be allowed in there. Okay, so let's take a look at a picture of. Um, a cartoon depiction of what it would look like. On the left side of this uh, picture, you'll see normal cells. Okay, so these humps are like each of the little individual pieces of candy that would have been on that necklace. And then these three little red bars that are held tightly together, those are a depiction of the tight junctions. And so on the left side, there's a healthy barrier of intestinal cells. They are being held tightly together by these tight junctions. Uh, these cells are resisting pathogens and toxins that are passing through the digestive tract. Now, on the right side of this picture, we have a leaky gut situation. The cells, as you can see, are separating. Okay, we've got gaps between each of these cells. It is allowing things to pass into the body and into the bloodstream, which should not be allowed. Okay. And then in a very severe situation, this third cell over here has actually started to degrade or break down itself. And now things are passing even more rapidly through. OK, so this is what's going on in the intestinal uh, lining when you when a horse had leaky gut. So I think it's important to point out that leaky gut really affects total body wellness. And so if you look into human research and you look at the human side, we know that uh, leaky gut has been correlated or linked to things like um, sinus and mouth conditions. 
uh, brain function, okay? So depression, anxiety, ADHD, all of those things can be directly related to the health of the gut. Um, things like your skin, so acne, rosacea, eczema, um, thyroid function, colon, constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, um, rheumatoid arthritis, headaches, fatigue, okay? All of these things we're finding out um, as, as researchers dive more into this realm of leaky gut and investigating what's going on, we're finding more and more connections. And so leaky gut really could be the root cause of many of the issues that are going on within the body. Now, here's a challenge. <laughs> there is no current definitive diagnosis or way to actually test for leaky gut. Okay, your veterinarian cannot go pull, pull blood, you can't take a hair sample, you can't take a urine or a fecal sample and determine whether or not a horse actually has leaky gut. So uh, we must rely, uh, so equine nutritionists and veterinarians both must rely on patient history, which is why it's really important for you all as horse owners to understand what the general symptoms are that are related to leaky gut, um, understand what the typical clinical signs are, uh, so that you can communicate these things back to the nutritionist and back to the veterinarians that you are working with. It's also important for you to communicate uh, to those professionals what the typical stressors are that your horse is under, okay? So as you'll find out as we move farther through this, uh, stress is really one of the major underlying causes of leaky gut. And then the last piece that you wanna make sure that, that you give a full history and communicate is what have you tried with, the, with this horse? If you've got a horse that uh, you think is having problems or you think has leaky gut and you've tried different approaches, make sure that you tell the nutritionist or the veterinarian that you're working with what you have tried because that will help guide uh, the approach that we take and it'll help us understand a little bit better what might be going on internally with that horse. So let's go over some signs of leaky gut. So you as a horse owner, get my slide to transition, there we go. So you as a horse owner um, are gonna be the first to notice that something is a little bit off, okay? Typically, it's going to start with performance cues, all right? So a lot of the times I will hear people say, you know, my horse who was normally very compliant is, you know, a very high level, um, very, you know, top end horse has been doing great, all of a sudden is starting to stiffen up. They're not responding to my cues. Uh, maybe they're just starting to hollow out their back. They're really becoming flat. I'm having a hard time getting them to, to pick up and round their back. Uh, maybe they're becoming really resistant to leg pressure. Um, a common thing that people will say is, all of a sudden my horse is being resistant in circles to the right or flexing to the left or uh, you know whatever the situation is, things that the horse normally uh, was, was wonderful at, all of a sudden they are getting resistance and reluctance from. The next thing that most horse owners are going to um, be seeing or noticing are behavioral cues, okay? So a horse that has typically been very um, compliant and very easy to be around, maybe all of a sudden becomes grouchy. Maybe they um, are getting cinchy. You know, all of a sudden when you go to tack up and you go to pull the girth, uh, that horse is throwing their ears back, they're reaching around, they're wanting to nip at you or, or even just touching their nose to you. I mean, they're, they're trying to give you a sign that something is hurting, okay? Pinning their ears is another big one. So not only when you're on the ground tacking up, uh, maybe when you're brushing, particularly if you're brushing under their belly and when you get back towards the flank area, if you pay attention, um, horses that are in pain a lot of times will start to pin their ears. Um, horses will also pin their ears when you're on their back. If you uh, move your leg back or give some kind of a cue that um, is touching a sensitive area, um, that pinning of the ears can be related to pain that they may be feeling throughout their digestive tract. Um, another sign could be a horse that is constantly shifting his weight. So if you have a horse that's standing there and just constantly from one back leg to the other, cocking one and then cocking the other. And they, it just seems like they can't get comfortable. Uh, that could be them showing an outward reflection of pain that they're having internally. And then another big one that um, I see is horses that start wringing their tail, particularly when they're in the middle of a run. 
Um, I see this often with um, running horses, particularly barrel horses, um, or horses that have to make very sudden um, changes in direction or changes in speeds. So if you think about the digestive tract, it's not held in there solid, okay? The digestive tract of a horse essentially hangs and it's very free moving. And so when horses, when you have forward motion with a horse and you're moving at a, a decent speed and then all of a sudden that horse has to stop or change directions quickly, the digesta can move freely in there. So it's almost like it, you know, if a horse is running and then stops, Okay, the digesta, the organs are all pushing up towards the front of that horse. Okay, so if there is pain, if there's inflammation going on within the, the digestive tract, that horse is going to give some kind of signal that can be pinning their ears that oftentimes is ringing their tail. So it's something to, to pay attention to as a horse owner. Uh, visual cues are going to be the next thing that you want to pay attention to. So a lot of times horses that are under digestive distress, particularly hindgut distress, are going to show a really tight and sunken in flank area. So I hope that you can appreciate from this picture. Um, I chose this one because the lighting was kind of ideal being from behind this horse. It, it, sh it casts a shadow in this flank area here. And so you can see that this horse is really kind of tucked up and drawn up and not in a good way, okay? Not in a highly trained, you know, fit way, but more in a just doesn't look right kind of way. Um, and I'm not talking about a horse that, you know, hasn't had access to water all day. Um, I'm talking about just this chronic kind of tight, sunken in look in their flank area. Um, that, that can be an indication of a horse that's dealing with some, some digestive distress. Um, horses that won't hold weight or have just a really poor top line, um, that can be another sign. And especially if those horses are being fed a crazy amount of feed. You know, I've, I've had people say, you know, um, I'm feeding this horse an excellent quality hay. You know, we've had the hay tested. It's great. Eating, eating plenty of it. Had teeth done. The horse has been dewormed. You know, you've covered all of the bases. And then they say, you know, I'm feeding 8, 10, 12 pounds of grain. And this horse just still does not look good. Okay. If you're putting that much nutrition into a horse, it's not the nutrition's fault, all right? That much nutrition into a horse should be doing something. And if it's not, that is a red flag that there is something going on in the intestinal tract, in the digestive tract, that's not allowing that horse to properly absorb nutrition or properly utilize nutrition. So in those situations, the first place that we need to go to is, is hey, let's look at, at the gut and the digestive health. Um, and then the, the fourth little topic there was dull hair coat, okay? So a lot of times um, the hair coat is a reflection of what's going on internally. And so if you've got a horse that just has a dull hair coat all of the time, that's, that's an indication that you might be missing something in the nutrition program. As you're working with your veterinarian, um, there are a few other things that you want to look at from a clinical sign standpoint. Um, now, if you have a horse that has recurrent colic or just, I mean, on and off all of the time, it seems like this horse has, has some level of colic going on. Okay, that could be a sign of a horse that's dealing with leaky gut. If you have a horse that uh, maybe has gastric ulcers and you've used omeprazole, okay, and the omeprazole treatment helps while he's on it, but then when you take that horse off of omeprazole, all of those symptoms and all of those signs revert right back, okay? So you put that horse back on omeprazole and things get better. You take the horse off of omeprazole and he re reverts back. Okay, and I've got, I mean, there are, there are people who are sitting there thinking, man, am I going to have to, I mean, is this horse going to have to live on omeprazole? Um, every time I take him off, the, the horse reverts back. Well, that could actually be an indication that, that you have some pretty serious digestive issues going on past the stomach. So leaky gut, hindgut, you know, dysbiosis, et cetera. Um, another clue would be skin conditions and allergies. Um, let's, let's talk about allergy panels for a second. So this picture is, um, and I understand that you guys most likely can't read that, but that is a snapshot of a particular allergy panel. And there are multiple low positives. I haven't counted them. I would guess there's maybe 15 low positives on there. So all of those red spots indicate a place where this horse tested uh, positive to a particular allergen. Now, on this particular panel, uh, positive response is considered anything from 100 
to 5,000. Okay, if you were to look at each of those red spots, you'd see that the majority of them are in the 100, 200, 300 range. Okay, so we call those low positives on that allergy panel. Now, I have people that will call and say, you know, I had my horse tested, we had the allergy panel done, and my horse is allergic to alfalfa, to orchard grass, to Bermuda grass, to beet pulp, to rice bran, to corn, to oats, to barley, and the list goes on. And they look at me and they say, I need you to formulate me a feed that my horse can eat, okay? And so I say, all right, let me, let me look at the allergy panel. Let's see what's going on. And when I take a look at the allergy panel almost every time, all of those red marks that they see that are testing as positives are what we consider these low positives. And so what is likely going on in that situation is that horse is probably dealing with leaky gut, meaning the cells that line the digestive tract have separated enough to allow things into the body that should not be there. Therefore, the body has basically a hyperimmune response to those allergens and causes then um, inflammation and causes a positive on the allergy panel. And so time and time again, if we come back and we correct the root cause, what we suspect is the root cause being leaky gut, if we can correct that, those allergies then self-correct. That horse can self-correct and deal with the things that are in his normal environment and be on a normal diet without having to deal with allergy shots or um, restricted foods. So let's talk then about uh, the causes of leaky gut. Stress, okay? Stress, stress, stress. Um, everything that we're gonna talk about when it comes to the causes of leaky gut is tied back to stresses or to stressors. Okay, so hauling, stalling, and performing, all right? If you've got a performance horse, you are doing at least one of those things on essentially a daily basis. And we don't think about it, but those things are really stressful for a horse, okay? A horse is designed to be turned out into open pastures, grazing all day with their buddies in a herd situation, okay? They, they do not like to be in stalls. They do not like to be confined into trailers, okay? And then adding the extra, um, the extra stress of putting a, a rider on top of them and then asking them to do things that they may or may not even understand. Okay, those are all really stressful things. Um, I wanna point out when researchers want to elicit stress within a horse. So if you're gonna design a research trial and you want to put a horse under stress, guess what that model is? It is literally loading those horses into a trailer and hauling them around, okay? Yet we do this every day all of the time and we don't think a thing about it. But I mean, can you imagine those horses? They don't, they don't know where we're going. They don't know why we're going. They don't know when we're coming home. They don't know if we're coming home. They don't know if you're bringing your bud, his buddy or if you're going to leave the buddies at home. Okay. I mean, there just are so many different things that are going through this horse's mind that are causing stresses. When it comes to stress, what we know through research is that 60% of performance horses have gastric ulcers. And if you look at race horses who are all stalled and under very intense training programs, that number jumps to 90%. Now I bring this up just to um, highlight the fact that we can scope for gastric ulcers, okay? So we can definitively diagnose and know whether or not a horse has gastric ulcers. So if a horse has gastric ulcers, they have them because of these stress factors, okay? And we know that these stress factors are also contributors to things that happen in the hindgut and, and leaky gut situations. So my point here is stress causes gastric distress within a horse. Even just because we can't scope for hindgut ulcers or just because we can't you know, definitively, we don't yet have a definitive test to know that a horse has leaky gut doesn't mean that it's not happening. So the next stress that I want to talk about is environmental stress, okay? Um, horses in, in, our, in our lives now are coming and going and living in all kinds of geographic regions, okay? You've got horses that maybe were purchased in, uh, had been living in Florida and now they're moving to Colorado or horses that had been living in Washington and now they're going to go spend the winter in Florida 
or New York to Texas or California to Maine. Okay, horses are moving and going all over. Sometimes we forget that those horses have to adapt to that new environment, okay? They have to adapt to the temperature changes. They have to adapt to the humidity, okay? Uh, heat stress is one thing that we know is a direct, uh, has a direct correlation to leaky gut. And so think of how many horses are living in California, Texas, Florida, in these hot environments on a year round basis. Um, I mean, they, they are prime candidates for dealing with leaky gut. And then when you have horses that are living in your northern climates, and then maybe they come south for a particular show or a particular event, and they're being subjected to humidity levels they're not used to, they're being subjected to temperature levels that they're not used to. Okay, just those small little things can trigger a horse to, to have leaky gut. And then the, the next piece is emotional stress, okay? Sometimes we forget that, you know, horses do deal with emotion, emotional stress. I mean, think about that horse that when you take their buddies away and you leave them tied up and they paw and they whinny and they nicker and, and they throw a fit, you know? I mean, that horse is under some serious emotional stress. And as horse owners, we just get annoyed by it or we say, oh, they need to grow up or they need to learn how to do that. Um, but we need to keep in mind that as we're making them, you know, tolerate that and, and deal with it, uh, we need to keep in mind that it could be affecting what's going on within their digestive tract. So the gut and the brain are actually connected. Okay, there's a nerve that runs between the two called the vagus nerve. And researchers, um, particularly in the human world, have actually looked into this quite a lot. Um, people who have things like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, um, ADHD, those people oftentimes have extreme disruptions within their gut, okay? So if you have um, a horse who's in, under anxiety, okay, you can see these outward signs of anxiety in a horse. You know that it is sending signals to that horse's gut and can be causing some disruptions. Now, a way to think about that um, kind of to put it in perspective for ourselves, is if you think about a time where you were just super nervous, maybe you had to um, talk in front of people, or maybe you had to, um, you know, you were going in to ask your boss for a promotion at work, or maybe you were about to break up with your significant other. I mean, whatever the situation is, uh, think about the feeling that you get in your stomach when you have anxiety or when you're really nervous, okay? Your stomach is literally just sitting there doing flip-flops. Well, nobody went, walked up to you and did anything to your stomach to make that pain happen, right? It happened because your brain, your mind was interpreting a stressful event, okay? And it was sending signals down that vagus nerve to your gut, okay? So those are the things that are happening with your horse every day that you load him in a trailer or make him stand tied when he wants to be with his buddies or are asking them to do things in the show pen that maybe they aren't used to doing or don't understand what you're asking, okay? All of those emotional anxieties can directly affect the gut. And then the last piece on the stressors is um, drugs and surgeries, okay? So antibiotic use, can uh, has a has a direct impact on the microbial environment within the horse's hind gut, um, and it can have a direct impact on the health of the epithelial cells that lie in the digestive tract. In addition, we know that things like um, bute and banamine, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, um, are directly correlated to uh, uh, weakening of the epithelial barrier of the intestinal tract. So essentially causing the, the cells to separate, causing them to be weaker, uh, causing them to degrade themselves. Uh, we know that NSAIDs are directly related to gastric ulcers. I mean, if you have a horse on butte um, for any period of time, you know, you have to be very careful because you can cause gastric ulcers. Okay, that same philosophy, when you have a horse that's on drugs, often um, you have to pay attention uh, to what's going on with their digestive tract because you could kick them into some kind of a leaky gut situation or some kind of an imbalance within their hind gut. And then don't forget about surgeries. I mean, obviously we all think about, you know, things like colic surgeries, but even elective surgeries, okay? So if you're gonna go in and have a bone chip removed or, 
or uh, you know do some kind of elective surgery, that horse is still going to be go undergoing drugs. Uh, they could be going undergoing anesthesia. Um, all of these things. So just keep in mind and be mindful that when you're doing these things with the horse, um, of, of the impact that it could have on that digestive tract. So what then do we have when it comes to a toolbox of support? Um, researchers are hitting hot and heavy on, you know, what, what can we do for, for horses with leaky gut? And, and it's not only horses that are, that are suffering from this, okay? We know from production um, livestock, uh, you know, feedlot animals, okay? That's one of the areas where we, we've caged a lot of data uh, because those animals are put into a very stressful environment. They're being pushed, you know, a very specific diet. They're in essentially, you know, a, a crowded atmosphere, et cetera. Um, and then those animals get harvested. And so the glory there is that, you know, we get to look at things, uh, see what's going on with the intestinal lining. And so a lot of the research has actually come from, you know, cattle, swine, poultry, uh, where we can actually evaluate the effectiveness of a lot of these tools. So I want to talk to you about five tools uh, that the researchers have found to be really effective when it comes to supporting and preventing leaky gut situations. So plasma, butyric acid, zinc, beta-glucans, and then lastly, microbial support are the three that we're going to cover. All right. So when you think about plasma, um, most people think of plasma when it comes to foal health, okay? So let's say you have a baby foal. Um, the, the goal, the first goal with any baby foal after it's born is to get it to stand and nurse from its mama. The reason that we do that is because that foal must have, must consume colostrum. Colostrum contains all of the antibodies that that foal needs for proper immune health, okay? And so in the first several, or I think it's the first 20 hours of, of life, uh, the intestinal tract of the foal is essentially wide open, okay? If you think about those tight junctions in those cells, okay, we've got essentially a wide open digestive tract because those antibodies are really large in size. And the foal needs to drink that colostrum, which contains those antibodies, needs to pass through the digestive tract and get into the body so that that foal can have a healthy immune system. Okay, well, let's say that that foal wasn't able to nurse. Maybe the mare died. Maybe she wouldn't let the foal nurse. Maybe he just wouldn't suck. Whatever the situation, if you get to that critical point where that foal is not getting colostrum in it, it becomes a very important big deal. And the first thing that happens is a veterinarian will come out and they will IV that foal with plasma. And the purpose of that is to provide those antibodies for that foal. Okay, so fast forward, uh, researchers have been evaluating the effects of plasma in an oral form. So we now have the ability to freeze, to spray dry, essentially plasma, to have a concentrated source of all of these biologically active proteins. So, I mean, there are over a thousand uh, active components in plasma. And when you spray it down, you can actually turn it then into a pellet, which can then be an oral supplement. And uh, that oral supplement then is gonna contain things like immunoglobulins, uh, immune factors, cellular growth factors, um, all kinds of biologically active proteins. And when I say biologically active, what I mean is that, that those proteins or those components have biological functions beyond just basic normal nutrition. Okay, so they're actually having an impact and playing a role within the gut. So what we know through research is that plasma does indeed help prevent and support leaky gut. And it does this by improving the function of the intestinal tight junctions. Okay, it reduces the deterioration of cells and it actually helps improve the barrier function of that intestinal lining. So let's take a look at a um, at a study that was done. So these are three pictures that were taken on an electron microscope, um, and it's basically showing the paracellular pathways of the intestinal epithelium. Okay, so fancy way of saying you're showing us, you know, we're, we're we're trying to see what happens under a challenged situation, and we're trying to create a gap in the intestine. Does it happen? And does plasma support it? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So in the first um, picture, so picture A all the way to the left, that is our control. The yellow uh, gold arrow is actually pointing to a little squiggly line. I hope you can appreciate the squiggly line um, that this arrow is pointing at. That is a normal closing. Okay, we've got a normal, uh, healthy looking um, intestinal epithelium or intestinal cells. Okay, the picture in the middle, B. You can appreciate, I hope, this dark, deep line. Okay, kind of this Y shape. What that is, is in that particular situation, uh, the epithelial cells were given an SEB challenge. And in that challenge, um, the, the goal there was to, to create or induce leaky gut, okay? So we're trying to increase permeability. We're trying to make a leaky situation. Okay, that indeed happened, and we can see that by that dark line. Now, in the third picture, which is the far right, what we did, what the researchers did here was they did the same SEB challenge that they did in the middle picture, but those animals were on an oral plasma supplement. And so by giving that oral plasma supplement, those animals responded much better to that challenge than the animals that were on a control or, or on no supplement. Okay. So it was significantly, the, the intestinal lining is significantly less permeable when animals are on a daily plasma supplement. And for you research buffs, that p-value was less than 0.01. All right, let's move into the next tool, butyric acid. Uh, butyrate is a volatile fatty acid, or a VFA. Um, VFAs are produced uh, in the hindgut uh, by anaerobic fermentation. Okay, so VFAs are essentially what give, you know, energy to the animal, okay? Uh, the, it, they are what happen when they, the microbes that live within the hindgut break down uh, fibers and carbohydrates, you know, forages. Uh, it creates these volatile fatty acids that are needed by the body. In particular, uh, butyric acid serves as an energy source for intestinal cell growth, okay? So I want to point out, intestinal cells are constantly regenerating. OK, and if you can supply butyric acid into the diet on top of what's normally being produced in the in the hindgut, you can actually support the regeneration and the growth of those intestinal cells. Keep those cells healthy, keep them happy um, and, and keep them from from degrading and causing a leaky gut situation. The other thing that researchers have found is that when you provide a butyric acid supplement, uh, that butyric acid is highly effective at supporting the tight junctions and keeping those cells held tightly together and preventing leaky gut. So we use a unique encapsulated form of butyric acid. Um, and the, the fact that it's encapsulated does two things for us. Number one, it makes the butyric acid more palatable. Okay, so I don't know how many of you listening have ever uh, experienced the smell uh, or possible taste of butyric acid, but it is very unpleasant. Um, honestly, vomit is the best way to describe it. Um, it, it just isn't, isn't appealing at all uh, for a human or a horse. And so by coating the butyric acid, it actually makes it palatable so that horses want to eat it. <coughs> the other thing that coating or encapsulating that butyric acid does is it allows for a slow release of the butyric acid. So the butyric acid um, is beneficial throughout the entire digestive tract, okay? So not just in the foregut and not just in the hindgut. You want a little bit of butyric acid to be released in both areas, the foregut and the hindgut. So the unique form of encapsulating um, that is done with this butyric acid allows for that slow release. Now, the next piece, um, the next tool that was in our toolbox was zinc. Zinc deficiency, so research shows that zinc deficiency actually causes epithelial barrier leaks within the GI tract. So what does that mean? In simple terms, if you're deficient in zinc, it'll cause leaky gut, okay? So a particular study wanted to evaluate, you know, what does it look like when you have a zinc deficient diet and when you have a diet that's adequate in zinc. Well, they found that by having a diet that's adequate in zinc, you can actually improve the gut barrier resistance 
to leaking by 61%, okay? We know that zinc supports many areas within the body. Um, you may be familiar with, um, so, you know, topical zinc applications. If, if you have a horse with a wound, uh, if you go out and look at the, you know, spray applications for wounds, almost every one of them has zinc as a major uh, component. We know that zinc is really important for skin health, skin integrity, hoof health, okay? So I wanna point out that epithelial cells don't just line the intestinal tract, okay? Your skin cells are epithelial cells, all right? So epithelial cells are basically providing that barrier to, to protect your body in a lot of different ways. And providing zinc in appropriate amounts on a daily basis can really help support that. Think also about immune health, okay? Um, if you're familiar with the, um, the medicine Zycam, okay, Zycam is designed, you know, they promote that as being uh, something that'll help shorten the duration of colds. Well, if you look at it, one of the main ingredients in Zycam is zinc, okay? So zinc plays a really important role in immune health. And then, as I said, uh, zinc has been shown to have a major impact on the health of the intestinal lining. So in fact, research actually shows that when um, a specific form of zinc, so zinc methionine complex, if you were going to go look up on a tag or something of a feed or a supplement and you wanted to know if this particular form of organic zinc was in there, that's how it would be listed as zinc methionine complex. Okay. Lots of research on this particular form. Uh, the research shows that it can actually support tight junctions. So not only intestinal tight junctions, but also mammary tight junctions, okay? That's gonna be very important for uh, your brood mares, okay? We need to make sure that those mares are able to provide um, adequate amounts and quality of milk uh, for their babies. And having zinc, particularly this zinc methionine complex in the diet can support that. The other um, piece of this is that they have found that this particular form of zinc can actually help lessen the severity of gastric ulcers. And in addition, this particular form of zinc was highly effective under heat stress. Okay, so then let's go into the next tool, beta-glucans. Uh, particularly the 1,3 linkage beta-glucans, okay? These specific beta-glucans are really good at providing immunity, providing immune protection to the host or to the animal. Um, basically, these are essentially uh, yeast cell walls that have um, almost think of it like alert receptors on the outside, and they're alerting the immune system to fungal pathogens. Okay, that's their primary role. So, how does that work? So, in phase one, basically, you've got 1 3 beta glucans being absorbed through what are called Peyer's patches which are a part of the gut associated lymphoid tissue or the, what we call GALT, okay? Then in phase two, you have immune cells recognizing those 1,3 beta glucans through very specific cell receptors. Then you move into phase three. The immune cells then engulf the 1,3 beta glucans, okay? It transports them then throughout the body and it releases little fragments of those 1,3 beta glucans. In phase four, then, you've got recognition and ingestion of those beta-glucans triggering the release of signaling molecules. And then those signaling molecules then activate other immune cells and promote their recruitment to the actual infected site. So then in the last phase, those activated immune cells are targeting and then destroying those foreign cells and those disease-causing organisms. Okay, so what does all of that really mean? At the molecular level, 1,3 beta glucans activate the immune cells, which increases those cells' ability to fight off disease or increases the host or the animal's ability to fight off disease. So basically what, what I'm saying here is that by minimizing the susceptibility, the susceptibility to disease, we're able to help prevent that systemic chronic inflammation and ultimately we're able to support the health of those intestinal cells and ultimately prevent leaky gut syndrome. All right, so let's jump into the last tool in our toolbox, which is microbial support. So one thing that we know is that pathogenic bacteria, such as clostridiums and E. coli, release endotoxins, okay? 
when those toxins are released, it damages the lining of the intestine, okay? So the pictures over here on the right, these really dark areas, those are areas of damage within, so I guess, let me back up a second. These are um, microvilli that are lining the intestinal tract, okay? And so we would want all of this microvilli to be covered by this light tan color. The bottom picture, we've got red areas here. That's just highlighting the damaged areas to help you guys see it a little better because I understand that you're probably not familiar, or comfortable uh, looking at pictures of microvilli. So all of the red areas is bad, okay? That's where you've got damage to the intestinal lining and you, you've got toxins that, um, those are points of entry for toxins, okay? When toxins enter, that then creates systemic inflammation. And when you have systemic inflammation, um, that body, like I said back in, in one of the earlier slides, that can cause a hyperimmune response. It can cause a, a horse to be more reactive to antigens and allergens, uh, can cause those uh, allergy panels to kind of fly off the radar. Um, but really, when you've got those small leaks, if you don't correct that and support that, ultimately those small leaks turn into large leaks, and then you end up with an animal that has leaky gut. So I want to point out that certain probiotics can help. Um, in particular, a unique strain of Bacillus subtilis. Okay, So we use um, a very specific strain that has been shown to inhibit pathogen growth. Okay, so particularly Colostridium, Streptococcus, and Rhodococcus. And this, what, it, what this probiotic does is it goes in, um, it essentially secretes antibacterial proteins that go in and attack that pathogen, okay? And so it, it does this by essentially penetrating that outer membrane or that outer layer and, and kind of lysing it or piercing it. And then the contents of that pathogen actually leak out, which causes the pathogen to die. So the nice thing about this is Bacillus subtilis, this probiotic, can actually go in there and do all of the dirty work, but it's a very natural form of it, and it doesn't harm the resident microflora. In fact, it, it helps support that normal, healthy microbial balance. Okay, so all of these tools are great, but I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking, okay, where, how do I get them? Where do I find them? Um, so plasma. You can find plasma in the Stride Animal Health Supplement called Lifeline Plus Equine. Okay, that is um, a specific uh, form. So that the plasma that is included in that, uh, Stride Animal Health is the only um, supplier of that in the United States. Okay, we're the only ones authorized to have that. Um, I say that and it's important because we wanna make sure that we have a clean source of plasma. Um, and so all of the plasma that we source actually comes to us from Europe. Um, so it's, it's very important um, that you source your plasma from clean sources um, who have done their due diligence um, in, in all of that. Um, we're actually going to be having another webinar that is specifically on plasma. And so we'll get into a lot more depth on plasma and, and its benefits. But just know that if you, if you want plasma, it's in Lifeline Plus. That is the plasma supplement. In addition, Blue Bonnet Feeds is releasing this month a brand new feed called Equiline Pro Care, and Plasma has been built into that particular feed. Um, I do want to point out the plasma in that feed is built in at about a 25% of maintenance rate uh, compared to the supplement. So, if, you know, if you're trying to uh, decide between the two, that's kind of your rate that's available. Now, butyric acid. Okay, GI Calm is the supplement from Stride Animal Health that is designed with butyric acid in it. Um, it is, uh, that is kind of our go-to supplement. If we've got a horse that we really feel like has leaky gut, is dealing with leaky gut, uh, GI Calm is, is the go-to product. Blue Bonnet Feeds um, with the Equiline Pro Care that they're releasing this month uh, did build butyric acid into that feed. So again, that is a really good feed for supporting those horses that are under a lot of daily stress from training, travel, hauling, and performance. The next tool is zinc. So where can you find zinc? Um, the particular form of butyric acid that is included in GI Calm comes with a zinc actually built in. So zinc and butyric acid are both in GI Calm. 
Now, if you want that very specific form of zinc, the zinc methionine complex, um, to kind of take it to that next level, you can find that in the 101 Diet Balancer from Stride Animal Health. And then if you're looking for a feed that has that particular form of zinc in it, um, every feed in the Blue Bonnet Feeds Intensify family uh, has that zinc in it. And every feed in the Equiline family from Blue Bonnet Feeds has that particular zinc methionine complex. If you are looking for um, the Bacillus subtilis, so that unique probiotic that can go in there and um, actually kill off uh, harmful pathogens, you can find that in the supplement GI Calm. You can also find that um, in the Blue Bonnet Feeds Intensify family, and it is also included in Equiline ProCare, again, that new feed that Blue Bonnet Feeds is launching this month. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, I hope that this has given kind of a general overview as to what leaky gut is, um, how to help recognize it. Um, again, work with an equine nutritionist, work with your veterinarian as you're trying to sort these things out. Um, feel free to visit strideanimalhealth.com. Um, and if, if you need some help or some support working through this, uh, please contact us, send us, send us an email. Uh, we have a team of nutritionists and consultants on staff, and that's what we do. You know, we, we want to help you work through the, the things that you're dealing with with your horse. We are more than happy to work directly with your veterinarian if they have questions. Um, you know, it really is a team approach. And so the more minds that you can put towards a difficult case, um, the, the better the outcome is going to be. Um, and also, if you are interested in trying any of those products, you can find more information on them at the strideanimalhealth.com website. You can also find information on the new Equiline ProCare feed um, at bluebonnetfeeds.com and also information on the rest of the Equiline family, the Intensify family, and other products from Blue Bonnet Feeds. Um, and again, if, if you're interested in a feed consult, Blue Bonnet Feeds um, and the team of nutritionists does that for free as well. Uh, just send an info, uh, send an email to info at acbluebonnet.com. So uh, with that, I'm going to open the floor um, to questions. If you happen to have a question, we've got just a few minutes. I'd like you to um, type your question into the chat box um, in your computer, and I'll try to get through as many of those as I can. Um, we've got, you know, just about 10 minutes here before um, it'll be time on the webinar. Uh, but I do want you to know that everything that goes into that chat box, I actually will get a transcript of. So if there's a question that gets asked that I don't get to, um, I can certainly send an email back to you with the answer to that uh, question um, in the follow-up email that we'll do with this. And then um, I also want to point out that if uh, you were attending the webinar and there are things that you feel like you missed or you wanna share this information with others, um, we will be sending a replay link out to everyone who registered. Um, so if you know someone who maybe didn't register and didn't watch it, tell them to go ahead and, and sign up. Uh, once that link, that replay is posted, they can sign up for it and get a copy. Okay, so I've got one question that came in. Um, is the full dose of plasma built into ProCare? So yeah, the um, so when I say, you know, maintenance versus performance dose, um, 200 grams of the Lifeline Equine Plus supplement is considered our performance dose. That dose is what was used in the majority of the research trials that showed the positive responses. Um, so I, I do want to point out that Plasma has over 500 published peer-reviewed studies um, to support its effectiveness. So that one, or that I'm sorry, that 200 grams per day, which is 80 grams of plasma is the performance dose. The maintenance dose, if you've got a horse that maybe isn't under a lot of stress, uh, the maintenance dose would be 100 grams per day, which is 40 grams of plasma. Okay, so the Equiline ProCare, the new feed from Blue Bonnet, um, as the question asked, you know, how much is, is in that? It's, it's a quarter of the maintenance dose is what uh, six pounds of the Equiline ProCare would supply. So if you have a horse that truly has um, 
you know, a serious leaky gut situation going on, you would certainly want to support that horse with additional plasma on top of what is in ProCare. All right, I've got another question that is uh, asking, should plasma be fed continuously? So you're going to get the best benefit out of the plasma if you do feed it continuously. Um, there are certain situations, so like pregnant mares or lactating mares, the research shows that if you can get those mares started on it at least 30 or 60 days prior to breeding, okay, you're going to have an improvement in the chance of uh, maintaining pregnancies. Okay, there was another trial that was done that looked at um, the health of the milk and the, the transfer to the foal and the health of the foal, and they found that if you feed plasma for at least, uh, so start. 30 days prior to folding, feed for 60 days post folding, that you get a really good support system for that foal's health. Um, now, my personal opinion, if you've got a mare that you care about and a foal that you care about, uh, just keep them on it year round because that plasma is gonna help uh, support and maintain pregnancy and support the health of the foal. Now, if you've got performance horses, um, plasma actually is really, I only talked about the, the, gas, uh, the gastrointestinal benefits, but plasma is really helpful for lung health, um, actually helps improve uh, recovery time, so stride length, range of motion in joints, um, allergens, seasonal allergy is really helpful there. So if you've got a horse that is a performance horse, I recommend keeping them on plasma um, daily and, and feeding it continuously. Now, if you're going to kick your horse out for three or four months out of the year and not do anything with them, um, sure, you can you can pull them back off. But if you're going to be actively riding and competing, I would certainly recommend keeping them on plasma on a daily basis. Um, another question is, how long does a horse stay on GI Calm? Okay, that's a great question. So if we decide that a horse needs to go on GI Calm, that typically means that, that we think this horse is in a leaky gut situation. Um, it depends how long the horse has been dealing with leaky gut, okay? So the longer that a horse has been dealing with leaky gut um, or the more compromised that we suspect their digestive tract is, the longer they're going to have to be on GI Calm. Um, as a general rule, two to three months is where we like to have people start, um, and then we just kind of reassess that um, horse from there. So you can also um, ratchet up or down that dose of GI Calm. So if we have a horse that um, maybe is in, in a really severe situation, uh, maybe we might go with two scoops twice a day, you know, for two weeks or even maybe 30 days. And then that next 30 days, we would come back to one scoop twice a day. And maybe then that next 30 days, we might try just half a scoop twice a day. So um, it'll, it'll really depend on the progress that we're seeing with that horse, um, the attitude and the symptoms that are being reported back from that owner. So it, it, it certainly is not a um, strict black and white. I do have um, one horse that has had to stay on GI Calm. Uh, this is a very high level dressage horse um, who this owner had literally tried everything. And GI Calm has been the only thing that has kept this horse uh, functioning at the high level that she needs him to function at. And so that horse um, is an example of one that does stay on GI Calm every day, all the time. Let's see, I'll try to take um, one more question here before we wrap up. Let's see, there's one on, another one on uh, ProCare, the plasma dose in ProCare. I think that I answered that maybe in the first question. Um, Okay, here's, here's one more. Um, how do you decide if the 21 day hindgut or the GI calm is the best choice for a horse? Okay, this is, this is a good question. We actually get this one a lot. So um, I definitely wanna go over this. Um, if a horse is just starting to exhibit some of the basic signs that we had talked about, some of those basic cues, maybe they're starting to be a little bit irritable or grouchy or cinchy, Maybe they're all of a sudden starting to be a little less resistant or a little less compliant to cues, more resistant. Um, or if they just are not maintaining weight correctly or you just can't get them to get that bloom. Okay, some of these early, early signs, uh, I would start those horses on the 21-day hindgut program. Now, with the 21-day hindgut program, 
we are targeting the hindgut health, okay? Um, so we have got mega, mega doses of probiotics and prebiotics, very specifically selected strains uh, that are going into that animal. We also have a product called Fish Oil Factor, which is going to provide EPA and DHA, okay? Those are very specific omega-3s that help support the intestinal lining, help reduce inflammation of the intestinal lining. Okay, for the major, the vast majority of horses, the 21-day hindgut program, and on a side note, there's actually a 30-day supply in there, uh, but typically people see results within that first 21 days, um, and that is the, the full feeding rates. That last, you know, nine days is essentially what we call the maintenance dose if you want to keep those horses on that maintenance uh, after that ends. All right, sorry, back to, back to the question. <laughs> Um, if I've got a horse in, in those situations, I usually start with the 21 day program. Now, if within the first five, six, seven days, we see that horse develop diarrhea, or if we see some major, uh, decline, you know, major bad things going on, symptoms are getting worse, whatever, uh, that's an indication, Hey, maybe, maybe this horse really is dealing with a more severe situation like actual leaky, leaky gut. Um, so in that case, we would have them push pause on the 21 day program, particularly on the fish oil factor. Okay. I would have them order the GI calm, continue feeding the ADR until GI calm arrives. And then we would get them going on GI calm. They would stay on GI calm for that two to three months. Um, and, and just assess that horse from there. Another red flag that helps me decide, you know, when do I just go straight to GI calm? If a horse has chronic diarrhea or chronic loose stool that you cannot clear up um, and you have tried everything under the sun and you cannot get this diarrhea to clear, uh, that's a pretty good indication that you're dealing with leaky gut. The reason for that is if you think about those cells, when they separate, when those tight junctions are loose and those cells have separated, not only are you allowing pathogens and things from, from the digestive tract to enter into the body, you're also allowing the fluids from the body to move back into the digestive tract. Okay, so that's what's causing that diarrhea. Um, so if a horse has chronic diarrhea, I would just go straight to GI calm. Okay, we are at our time. Again, I want to thank everyone for attending, and I will um, certainly keep a transcript of these questions. And if there was one that I didn't get to, I will be sure to seek you out and uh, send an email response to that. So I want everyone to make sure to um, stay tuned uh, to your email that you use to register for this seminar. Uh, a replay will be sent to that email uh, um, and then also some more information on the products that we talked about today. And then uh, if you're lucky, you may even notice a special discount or a coupon available to everyone who watched and signed up. So with that, I want to thank you and I want everyone to enjoy the rest of their day.